Welcome to the podcast for Gateway Baptist Church. You're listening to a message from our Mackenzie campus. Find us at gatewaybaptist.com.au if you'd like to connect with us as we seek to change lives by following Jesus in our community, our nation, and our world. Hey, Susan, sir, we're continuing our Faith at Work series uh, today. Over the next seven weeks, we're going to be reading through the book of James. I want to encourage you over these uh, seven weeks to read the book of James to reflect on what God is saying to you through the book of James and to obey what God says in the book of James. You know, all of Scripture is God-breathed. All of Scripture helps us to understand more of who God is and what it means to, to worship Him and to live in obedience to Him. But, but some parts of the Bible, we have to, you know, understand a whole lot more of the context. Some parts of the Old Testament, you know, are steeped in ancient culture and to help us to, to understand how to be obedient to what God is saying there, we need to understand the culture. A lot of the Old Testament is Old Testament law and there were laws that were particularly for the uh, people of Israel to obey that were in covenant uh, with God. Some of it is wisdom literature and it's speaking, you know, wisdom into our hearts and, and, and understanding. We need to understand the type of literature and the culture it was spoken into uh, to know how to obey. All of Scripture is God-breathed. It's helpful to, uh, in every way for us to understand God and to know how to obey God. But the book of James is one of the most intensely practical books in the Bible. It's just very, very practical. It's all about what we do, how we actually obey uh, God's Word, how we put it into action, and it is profoundly relevant. It it was written 2,000 years ago. But as you read the book of James, it's almost like it's just speaking to our culture today. It's speaking into our very situations today. That's why we're doing this series uh, right now. I just uh, believe God is, is, is calling us to listen to his word and to obey his word radically. So I encourage you over uh, these next few weeks to read the book of James, reflect on what is God is saying to you in the book of James and obey what God says. And particularly in this series, we're focusing on what it looks like to put our faith into action at work. What does our faith at work look like at work? Which isn't always easy. It's not always easy to put our faith into action at work because, you know, work can be, you know, places where it's it's very hectic and where there's there's a whole lot of pressure Work can be very worldly places. It seems like there's a massive difference between what happens here on a Sunday and what happens in our workplaces. And let's just be honest here this morning. The hardest part about putting our faith into action in the workplace is that some people at work are really annoying and they make us angry. You know, some some people at work are rude. Some people are selfish. You know, some, some, some people are lazy and they don't follow through on what they said they're going to do. Some people are arrogant and it's annoying and it makes you angry. And some people annoy you and you can't even, you don't even know the words to know why they annoy you. They just annoy you and they make you angry. Does anybody here, you know, have somebody at work that is annoying? Come on, put your hand up high. If you haven't got your hand up, you're probably the person (laughs) at work that's really annoying and you're making other people angry. It's not just at work. If if home is your workplace, then this happens at home too. Sometimes, you know, it's it's, it's people that we find really hard to love that are very annoying. And sometimes it's actually the people that we love the most that are the most annoying. But we've all got some people in our workplaces, in our everyday lives that are annoying and tend to make us angry. I want us to consider something this morning. Maybe that annoying person at work or at home 
God's actually put them there. He's put them there not to get your temper to flare up, your anger to rise up, or your blood to boil up. But God's actually put that person there to help you grow up. God's kind like that. He puts people around us that he knows will help us to grow up because that's what he wants. He's actually more interested in you being holy than happy. He, He really wants you to grow up and become more like Jesus. All good parents want their kids to grow up. You know, we celebrate growth in families. You know, many families will have a wall that looks a little bit like this. It may not have all the words on it, but, you know, there's somewhere, you know, in your, your home, you might have a place where you measure your, you know, your kid's growth, you know, at age one, this height, first steps, age two, started saying my first words, age four, learnt to poop and wipe themselves. What a great and glorious day of the Lord that is. Everyone say, can we say here an amen? How good is that when that happens? You know, first day at school. And then at 14, you know, our boys grow up and they start to grunt at everybody. And they smell very, very bad. And, and, at, and at 14, you know, girls, you know, start to take, you know, an incessant number of selfies in the mirror and, and talk incessantly. And it's a miracle that, you know, 14 year old boys and girls girls ever, you know, get together and work things out. You know, at some point we want, you know, our kids to get independent and start to drive and we're hoping that one day they'll actually finish school and and become an adult. You know, we celebrate growth. We celebrate these moments as, as our children grow and as they develop and as a parent, as a human parent, we'd be really worried if our kids' growth and development was stunted. We'd actually be really worried if our you know, kids were still wearing nappies at eight or our son is still grunting at girls at 28. You know, that, that would be concerning if, if that was true. We'd be concerned about their, their, their growth and their development. All parents want their kids to, to grow up, to mature, to, to develop. Our Father in heaven wants us to grow up. He doesn't just want us to grow up physically, but he wants us to grow up relationally. He wants us to grow up spiritually. He wants us to become mature, and he celebrates growth. You know, maybe there's actually like a spiritual growth chart that our Father in heaven, you know, has for us. You know, maybe he's he's wanting all of us to grow up, to move from born again to actually loving others the way that he loves us and actually sacrificing our own lives to put others first. And sometimes we think, if I just grow up with God, then I'll get on better with people. I'll love people more. And that's true. But it's also true the other way around. Sometimes God's put people in our lives that as we work out how to get on with people... It's actually the catalyst for us to grow up with God. And maybe there's someone in your world right now, in your workplace, in your family, in your street, in your neighborhood, someone that's part of your life that's very, very annoying, tends to make you angry, and God's actually put them there, and he wants you to get on with them so that you will grow up with God. James, in this passage... He says, when you grow up with God, you get on with people. When you get on with people, you grow up with God. Now, one of the reasons that our growth gets stunted spiritually is because growth is painful. Growth is painful. You know, that uh, chart I had up there before is not exactly my growth chart, but there's some similarities. I actually grew in one year, in one 12 month period. I grew from being five foot four to six foot two in one 12 month period. And I was in agony. I got up every morning, I could hardly move. 
I was crawling around like an 85-year-old, just sort of shuffling around just to go and get breakfast. Mum eventually took me to the doctor, and the doctor looked at us very seriously and said, he's got Osgood Slatter's disease. And me and mum looked at each other and thought, I'm going to die any minute. I've got some tropical disease, and I haven't yet been to the tropics. And he says, don't panic. It's just growing pains. His body is growing so fast that the ligaments in the joints and the muscles around it can't keep up, and it's painful. It'll be all right. It'll grow into his body. Growth is painful physically. You go to the gym and you lift weights, not because you enjoy it. You're actually actually stretching and and tearing your muscles as you lift weights. Why? Because why do you go through that pain? Because as your muscles recover, they grow. They get bigger, you get fitter, you get stronger. Growth is painful. Physically, growth is painful. Spiritually and relationally, in this passage we're going to read in James, he's saying what will help you to grow is actually when you choose to obey the Word of God even when you don't feel like it. What will help you to grow is when you love other people, even when they're annoying, even when, they're, they, when they make you angry. When you grow up with God, you get on with people. When you get on with people, you grow up with God. Let's read James chapter 1. We're just going to read it in bits, starting at verse 19. It says, My dear brothers and sisters, this is for everyone, boys and girls. We're all in this together. Take note of this. This is really important, he says. Everyone, everyone say everyone. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Why? Why? Well, James tells us why. Because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Human anger doesn't produce the righteous life, the right life, the life that God desires for us. Human anger doesn't help us to grow up and become more like Jesus. It doesn't help us to grow up and and, and reflect in a greater way the image of God within us. And so firstly, James says, if you want to grow up with God and get up, get on with people, firstly, what you've got to do is slow down. Be slow. Slow to speak. Slow to anger. You know, the Olympics just started. Uh, last few days, who's been watching the Olympics already? Glued to the TV. You know, I've, I've looked through all of the different competitions in the Olympics. There is no competition where you celebrate slowness. In the Olympics, the fastest is the first. The fastest gets gold. There's no competition for running slow. There's no competition for swimming slow. There's no competition for cycling slow. It's all about being the fastest. When you're the fastest, you're the first. When you're fastest, you get the gold. Even in a sport that I don't think is really a sport, and I actually think about being slow, walking, as whoever walks the fastest gets the gold. What a stupid sport. If you just kind of walk along like this, like you're supposed to walk, you know, you get nothing. But if you walk like an idiot and kind of wiggle everything around, they give you a gold medal. What a silly sport. If you want to go fast, learn to run. (laughs) Walking fast. Who gets a gold medal for walking fast? I'm sorry for all of the walkers uh, online. You see, we, we celebrate being fast, but God actually says it's good to be slow. In fact, slowness is one of God's best qualities. It's one of his top five. You know, when, when God introduces himself to, to, to Moses at Mount Sinai, you know, the people of Israel didn't really know who God was. When God showed up at the burning bush, and, 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 and Moses you know, starts hearing the voice of God. And, and Moses says, I don't know who you are, and none of the people know who you are. You know, who will I say has, has sent me? And, and God's really helpful. He says, say, I am who I am has sent you. Not a lot of description in that. 
And then he says, I'm the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And kind of somewhere in their distant past, they remembered the stories and the covenant that God had made with their ancestors. But they didn't really know God. They've been in slavery for 400 years. And God in his grace, he leads them you know, out of Egypt, across the Red Sea. They get to Mount Sinai and he renews the covenant. He renews the agreement of how to live in relationship with him. And Moses said to him, this is, this is great, God, but I want to see your glory. I want to see what you're like. I want to understand more of who you are. And God says, well, you can't handle it, but if you hide behind that rock, I will cause all my glory you know, to pass in front of you. And so God passes in front of Moses and he introduces himself to Moses and to the people of Israel. And what does he say? Top five qualities. Think of all of the things that God have, could have said about himself. He could have said, I'm holy. He could have said, I'm a God of, of peace. He could have said, I'm a God of abundant kindness. He could have said, I'm omnipresent. He could have said, I'm omniscient. He could have said, I'm omnipotent. But even he doesn't use those words. Only Bible colleges use those words. You know, he could have used all of these, you know, big words to describe himself. But what is the top five that God uses to describe himself? of Exodus chapter 34, it says this, the Lord, the Lord, compassionate and gracious God, ready for this, say it with me, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. This is the top five God thinks of. Compassion, yeah, we get that. We see it right through the Bible. Grace, yeah, we're saved by grace. Love, God is love. Faithfulness is faithful from generation to generation. What else gets in the top five qualities of God as God introduces himself? Slowness. Slow to anger is in the top five. And it should be celebrated. It's one of God's greatest qualities we should be so thankful for. The people of Israel should be so thankful because they kept making these promises to God and they kept being unfaithful. And they kept being ungrateful. And God was slow to anger and he didn't wipe them out. When they were annoying, he was slow to anger. And we should be grateful. We should be thankful. Because we keep breaking our promises to God. We keep being unfaithful. We keep being ungrateful. And God should wipe us out. But he is slow to anger. David puts it into a psalm. He takes these you know, verses in, in Exodus 34 and he expounds it a little bit, expands it a little bit in a psalm. He says, the Lord is compassionate and gracious, Psalm 103, slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. Can everybody say hallelujah? Thank you, God. He's compassionate. He's gracious. He's slow to anger. He's abandoning in love. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. I, for one, am very, very thankful that God treats me like that. Now, this is the tough bit. We're called to love others in the same way he loves us. That means being slow to anger. I, I wonder if some of us might need to actually memorize those couple of verses in Psalm 103. And next time in the workplace, you can feel your temper flaring up. You can feel your anger rising up. You can feel your blood boiling up. And you're about to explode in anger. You might just need to slow down just long enough to repeat Psalm 103, verse 8 and 9. The Lord is compassionate and gracious. He's slow to anger. He's abounding in love. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay me according to my iniquities. Just slow down. Remember how God treats you. Maybe just before you're about to say something you regret at home, in the workplace, just slow down. 
Slow down before you send that email where you copy all in capitals, underlined. Slow down before you put that rant on Facebook. Slow down before you gossip about that person at the water cooler. Just slow down. Because God is slow to anger. And I'm so thankful for that. And he calls us to love others in the same way. If you want to grow up with God, you see, he says, human anger does not produce the righteous life that God desires. Human anger does not help us to grow up and get on with people. If you do want to grow up with God and get on with people, then firstly, you've got to slow down. And secondly, you've got to listen up. James says, my dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen. Have you ever noticed that if you've got someone at work or in your family or yes, acquaintance somehow that really annoys you, makes you angry, and, and you've actually stopped to listen to their story, listen to what's really going on for them, that your heart over time has actually changed from anger to empathy? Has that happened for anybody? If it hasn't happened for you, then it should. This is what James says, that we're to be slow to speak, slow to anger, and quick to listen. One of the best assignments I ever did at Bible college was in a subject called culture and ministry. And we, we, had, we were learning about how different cultures help us to you know, shape our worldview, shape our understanding of God. And one of the assignments we had to do is we had to go and find someone from a completely different culture to us and hear their story, hear how it shaped their worldview, shaped their, their understanding of God. And I had these two boys in my youth group at the time that were so annoying. They made me angry. I wanted to hurt them. Bilal and Rabi. Because they hurt people. They stole stuff from our youth group. They lied. They wrecked every game I tried to run, every talk I tried to talk. I was angry with them. They were very annoying. And so I chose to do this assignment with them. And I invited myself into their home and I found out that they'd been refugees from Lebanon when their mum died in a, in a mortar attack. You know, growing up with, with a dad and no mum and their dad couldn't speak English and they were in this brand new country and they were learning to speak English. And as I sat there with them for a couple of hours, it didn't excuse their bad behaviour but it did change my heart. I began to feel empathy for these boys. I began to feel what God feels for these boys. And that's all I can control. It's not my responsibility to change their behavior. Only God can do that by the power of the gospel, the power of the Holy Spirit working in their lives. But what I can do is I can allow the Holy Spirit to change my heart and so I can love them the way that God loves them. I want to encourage you, if you've got someone in the workplace, you've got someone in your world that's really annoying you, really getting up your nose, really you, you tend to find yourself angry when you're talking to them, just start to ask them questions. Ask them about their family. Ask them about their background. Ask them what's been going on for them. Ask them what their big dreams for life are. You know, ask them just how they're feeling. Check in on how they're doing. And if you just get a grunt or an angry response for two weeks, keep going. And see if God doesn't change something in their heart as he changes something in your heart. James in this passage is saying, if you want to grow up with God and get on with people, firstly, you've got to listen to people. And then secondly, almost in the sec next breath, he says, you've got to listen to God's word. You've got to listen to people. 
But you also got to listen to God's word because the God's word, where listening to people might change our heart, might change our heart from anger to empathy. Listening to God's word actually reveals the will of God in a world, in a workplace where evil is prevalent. And so he says in, in verse 21, he says, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent and humbly accept the word planted in you which can save you. Now you need to understand, James, as he's writing this letter, is writing to people who have already been saved by the gospel. They've already put their faith in Jesus. And so what he's talking about here is the ongoing work of sanctification, of working out our salvation with fear and trembling. He's saying there's a word planted in you. In this season where you're getting annoyed with this person that's making you angry, God's word is speaking into that very situation, speaking into that very relationship. And sometimes, you know, God's word ends up just being snatched away by the devil. Sometimes Jesus says, God's word is in such shallow soil that we never grow up and get on with people. And sometimes God's word, you know, gets mixed in with all the worries of this world and we get so focused on everything else that's going on in the world, we don't allow God's word to speak into this tough situation that we're in that can help us to grow up. But he says sometimes the word lands on good soil. It gets accepted and it gets understood and it actually causes us to grow. You see, whoever you're annoyed with right now, whatever is making you angry right now. God has got a word for you in this season to help you grow up with God, become more like Him and to get on with people. But sometimes in the emotions of these broken relationships, we don't slow down and listen up and accept God's word and then we never grow up. You want to grow up? with God and get on with people, slow down, listen up. And then the last part's the hard part. Let's keep reading verse uh, 22. It says, do not merely listen to the word. You've got to listen to it, but do not merely listen to it. And so deceive yourselves, do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself, goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they've heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. You want to know how to experience blessing? Obedience. You want to be blessed by God? Obey God's word. If you want to grow up with God and get on with people, slow down, listen up and obey today. Don't put it off. Obey today. He wants you to obey because he actually wants to bless your relationships. He wants, you to, he wants to bless your relationship with him. He wants you to grow up, become more intimate with him, become more like him. He wants to bless your relationships with the people around you. But it actually comes through obedience and it's not always easy. So sometimes we just don't want to forgive people. We don't want to put others first. We, we don't want to forgive as Jesus has forgiven us. But if you really want to be blessed, you really want to grow up with God and get on with people, you got to slow down, you got to listen up, and you got to obey today. And he says, if you don't obey, it's like looking in the mirror, seeing what's wrong, and never fixing it. Going away and forgetting what you even look like. I, I, it turns out I need to look in the mirror a little more often. Susan turned 50 last week. She looks pretty good for a 50-year-old. Now give her a hand. But she said to me on her 50th birthday, you need to start moisturising, boy. You're starting to get wrinkly and old. I looked in the mirror and she was right. So I've been moisturising for a week. Doesn't change much. But, but I actually don't spend a lot of time looking in the mirror. I regularly or a couple of times a week drag myself out of bed to, uh, to get to the gym. And I forget to look in the mirror. And so I normally turn up to the gym looking like this. I, I get there 
and there's mirrors everywhere and you can't escape. And I'm quickly there trying to do my hair because I haven't looked in the mirror and, and fixed myself up. But this has been going on my whole life. You know, when, when I was, before I was married, I was a little bit of a grub. And I remember coming to church one Sunday, I'd, uh, I woke up late quickly jumped out of bed and I just grabbed the jeans that were on my floor uh, that I wore the night before, ran out the door, got to church and uh, met a friend there named James who's brought his girlfriend for the first name, Sonia. As I'm talking to Sonia, I could feel this lump down the bottom of my jeans. And I looked down and there is my red undies from last night <laughs> that was still in the jeans. And I'm looking down, and I'm talking to Sonia, and I'm thinking I should have really looked in the mirror before I ran out the door. And every step I took, they're falling more and more out, and I'm, I'm kind of walking like this. And eventually they fell all the way out. And I just picked them up and kept talking to Sonia, just stuffed them in my pocket. I should have looked in the mirror. You know, a few years later, I became a school chaplain and we had one daughter by then and Susan had a bad night with Jess. And, and so first day as a chaplain, brand new school, 23 years old, you know, I, I get up, really a bit nervous about, you know, first, uh, first day on the job, didn't really look, it didn't turn the light on to wake Susan up, didn't look in the mirror very well, but all sorts of meetings, got to recess and I met with nearly the whole staff. There was one girl at the school as a student I knew she walks up to me at recess and said Jason have you got your shirt on inside out and I looked down and I did I should have looked in the mirror and fixed what I saw I haven't learnt yesterday I'm now a grandfather I take Aurelia to the park we went on the swings we went on the slippery dip. We played in the park for about half an hour. There's young mums with little kids everywhere. I think I was the only grandpa there. And I walked back with Aurelia when she'd had enough. And, uh, and Susan looks at me as she starts walking behind me and said, did you look in the mirror before you got up this, when you got up this morning? I said, no. Why? She said, have a look at the back of your jeans. <laughs> Apparently the young mums got a bit more than what they bargained for at the playground. <laughs> I gotta learn to look in the mirror and do a 360. <laughs> and fix up what needs to get fixed up. James says, there's no point looking in the mirror if you don't fix what you see. There's no point reading the Bible and understanding it all, reading it for 50 minutes a day if you actually don't do what it says. It'll be like licking in the mirror and not fixing your hair or changing your jeans. You'd be deceiving yourself. You actually, actually want to grow up with God, get on with people. You want to reflect the image of God to the people around you. Slow down, listen up, but then you've actually got to obey what God's Word says. When Jesus has given his famous sermon, Sermon on the Mount, he actually talks about what it looks like to be a follower of Jesus, what it looks like to make a difference in the world, what it looks like to grow up, become mature in our faith and get on with people. He says it means forgiving as Jesus forgives you. Getting rid of lust and envy towards other people and worry about worldly things, praying for those who hurt you, loving your enemies, being the peacemaker in every situation, giving to the needy, caring for the poor, turning the other cheek, being faithful in marriage, going the extra mile, putting others first. That's what it looks like to follow Jesus. And James, his brother, is, you know, a couple of decades later, is unpacking how we actually grow up into the image of Jesus and get on with the people around us. He says, if you want your relationships to be blessed, 
You've got to be obedient to God's word. This is what James says in the last part of this passage. It says, those who consider themselves religious and yet don't keep a tight rein on their tongues deceive themselves. If you're using your tongue in anger and bitterness and unforgiveness to put people down rather than to build people up, you're deceiving yourself. You haven't yet grown up. Their religion, he says, is worthless. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. He says, this is, this is what really matters to God. When, when you grow up and you put worldly things you know, aside and you actually speak to people in a way that reflects the love and the grace of God and you actually are so loving towards people that you actually reach out to those in need in your community, to the orphans and the widows. And you need to understand in this culture, they were the least. You didn't normally didn't bother with those people. But Jesus is saying, those people really matter to me. I want you to love those people. I want you to love all people. I tell you, our world today needs a community like this. A world that's so divided needs a church that's united around loving God and loving people with everything that we got. We see no greater example of the blessing of obedience, of the power of obedience to bless relationships than on the cross. In Philippians 2, Paul is saying to the church there, he says, actually, don't do anything out of selfish ambition. Don't consider anyone. Don't consider yourself better than anybody else, but actually put others first. Value others above yourself. You should have the same mind as Jesus, the same life, the same attitude of Jesus, who being in very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but he made himself nothing. And verse 8, he became obedient to death, even death on a cross. And that obedience brought the greatest relational and spiritual blessing this world has ever known. Out of that humble obedience to the Word of God, our relationship with God is restored and we receive the power to be the ones that restore relationships with one another in our workplace, in our families, in our neighborhoods. I tell you, our world needs the church to grow up and get on with people to grow up with God, to become more like Jesus and to get on with people, to love people the way that Jesus loved people. I'd love us as a community just to pray for each other. I'd, I'd just encourage you today just to be honest and humble If you've got someone at work, someone in your workplace, someone in, you know, your area of influence, you just find yourself getting annoyed and angry. And today, in God's Word, you just just know He's saying, hey, it's time to slow down. Listen up and obey His Word. Love others the way that He loves us. Time to grow up with God and get on with people. I just... I'm going to invite you down the front, actually. Let's stand together. Come on, let's stand together. We can pray for each other with masks on. Come on, let's stand. We're going, we're going to sing a song which talks about God. Would you heal our heart, make it whole? Would you show us how to love the way that you loved us? If that is your heart cry today, you actually want that person that's annoying you, that person that's making you angry, to be the person that actually helps you to grow up and become more like Christ. You actually want to show the love of Christ to that person. I'm just going to invite you to come down the front while I pray right now. I'm going to pray for all of us together.
Come on, just, just as I'm praying, just walk. I, my eyes will be closed. Everyone who's not walking can have their eyes closed. But if you just need to be down the front, just come. Come today. You just know today, it's, you just, God's just challenging. It's time to grow up and get on with people. Just come. There might be someone in your family. There might be someone in your workplace. I don't know who it is. There might be pain way back in the past. There might be pain from Friday, 5 o'clock in the afternoon. But God, tonight, today even, God, would you convict us by your spirit? God, would you right now just begin to change our hearts? God, would you remind us of the way that you treat us? The way that you show so much love and grace to us. You're so slow to anger with us. God, would you help us today by the power of your spirit? to be obedient to your word, to reflect your love and grace to the people around us. In the process, God, would you help us to grow up? I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, we're going to start to sing. If you want to come and join these guys, just come and stand down the front, then I'm going to get get some people to come and stand with you. Come on, there's some more of you that need to come. Just receive from God this morning. front here receiving prayer just right now just just begin to pray for your workplace just begin to pray that you would be that person of compassion and grace a person that's slow to anger and abounding in love pray a blessing over the people in your workplace come on wherever you are here today now it's just time to pray i'm going to get our our prayer team just praying for those down the front if you're not down here on right now just begin to pray a blessing over your workplace pray that people would see the grace of God at work in your workplace come on just choose someone to pray for choose someone that God would pour out an abundant blessing come on let's all pray together let's lift our voices in prayer to forgive people that have hurt you, family members that have caused you pain. Some of you, the prayer you need to pray right now is actually a prayer of confession. Maybe that's all you can do right now is just confess your sin to God. I ask that He'd forgive your sin. Even if you're not yet ready to forgive, I ask that He'd give you the power to one day forgive. that you would heal hearts here this morning. God, would you heal broken hearts where there's scars from words that have been spoken. God, would you pour out your healing power. 
God, would you make us whole? God, I pray for forgiveness to fly. God, I pray for a touch of grace. God, I pray for an abundance of grace, that you might so fill us with grace, that we would be people that spread your grace throughout our community. God, I pray that we would be a stable people, a people that are so secure in your love, that in the midst of panic and stress, that we would be stable people in the workplace. To speak truth into people's hearts. God, would you pour out a blessing in our workplaces? Heal our hearts today. Let's sing this together. Come on, God, would you heal our heart and make us whole? people as we finish this morning. Nathan and Phoebe, I just, uh, just want to encourage you guys. This really just simple picture I think God gave me for you. It's just like uh, an, an air vent. And I just, just felt like as I was praying for it that God was saying, you're going you're gonna to sit with people and talk with people and pray with people and, and they're going to vent some stuff that's actually quite toxic and, and you're going to help them to release some of that bitterness and unforgiveness, that which is toxic and untrue. People that don't understand their identity they have in Christ. There's gonna be, there's gonna be pain. Just, the word toxic's the word that I just kept coming into my mind. And, and as you listen to them and pray with them, it's gonna be like this, this toxicity comes out of them. And you're gonna, you're gonna speak God's truth into their hearts. It's like just a breath of fresh air coming into people's life and just bring a new life and a new fire in God. I don't think you're going to have to go looking for those opportunities. I think you're just going to have to remind yourself when they come, this is what God's calling you to do. Speak life. Help people let go of bitterness and, and envy, unforgiveness. Scott and Jenny, just want to encourage you guys, just as I was, just you came into my mind during worship this morning. And just, uh, this is this picture of you guys are standing on the shoulders of some great godly people. You've got a legacy in your lives, both individually and together. You've got this legacy you're standing on, you know, some really just the shoulders of some godly people. And I felt like, you know, God is just saying, hey, He's using you to do that now. He's using, there's others that are going to stand on your shoulders and they're your kids, but there's people that He's gathering around you in the workplace, in the church, and they're going to stand on your shoulders. You're going, to, you're going to help them find great foundations in God. You're going to speak the, the truth of God's Word into the next generation in, in, in a way that He's going to build strong foundations that when the storms come, just uh, Matthew 7 just came into, into my heart when I was thinking of you guys. You know, it, it says, you know, those who hear you know, these words of mine and put them into practice will be like wise people who build their houses on the rock. When the storms come, uh, the house still stands. But those who don't hear, or well, those who hear and don't obey, actually it's like shift, shifting sands. They build their house on the sand. Storm comes and there's lots of storms coming. Everything comes crashing down. I just believe God wants to encourage you as you keep speaking truth into the next generation, into your family and into those in the church and your work, respective workplaces. You're speaking truth into the next generation. You're going to build strong foundations and storms will come, but they're going to stand 
They're going to stand on the Word of God. They're going to stand on your shoulders. You're going to be a blessing to me. Hey, why don't you find someone to encourage this morning? I know it's not easy talking through a mask, but uh, find someone to encourage this morning. I'm actually going to speak about that next week. James goes on to talk about using our words to build up and to bless, not to pull down and to curse. And I think we've all got a role to do in playing that, in our play in doing that. So I'll talk about that uh, next week. Our prayer team will be down here for a little while if you want someone to pray with you. If you haven't yet, put your faith in Jesus and you chose to come along to church this morning with someone in a mask, then God's actually drawing you here for some supernatural purpose. And there's someone down the front here who'd just love to pray with you. If you'd like to say yes to Jesus, put your faith in Him this morning. Just come and talk to one of these prayer team, pastoral team down the front. We'd love to, uh, we'd love to see that word of truth get planted uh, within you. Have a great week. See you next Sunday. Keep reading James. Keep listening to His word. And why don't you put it into practice this week? God bless you. We hope you've been blessed by this message. If we can pray for you or you would like to take a further step in your relationship with Jesus, we would love to get connected with you. Please head to gatewaybaptist.com.au and click on Get Connected to let us know.